Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious and merciful. Assalamualaikum. May peace be upon you. Salam sejahtera. Emeritus Professor Dr. Osman Baka, International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, Stack. Brother Muhammad Faisal Abdul Aziz, President of Muslim Youth Movement of Malaysia. Mr. Pak Chee Han, Vajrana Buddhist Council of Malaysia. Mr. Tan Ling Huat, Theravada Buddhist Council of Malaysia. Mr. Cassie Liu, Tibetan Buddhist Culture Center of Malaysia. Mr. Sayyid Jamaluddin Bahram Miri, International Student of Islamic Psychology, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen, Brothers and Sisters of Faith, in Zoom and all social media platforms who have been following the event. Selamat datang and welcome to the keynote closing address of the Islam Buddhism Eco Dialogue IBAT 2022. I am Adliza Kwan, the MC for this session. Ladies and gentlemen, IBAT Conference 2022 come into being with a mission to, bring, to bridging this wisdom from Islamic and Buddhist traditions inspire the faith, understanding and respect and work towards a harmonious and compassionate society in particular of saving both human and nature from climate emergency. For the past two days, this conference has featured 12 distinguished speakers and presenters that covered various topics, participated by hundreds of participants in Zoom and Facebook Lives from Malaysia, Singapore, India, Thailand, United Kingdom, USA and other parts of the world. To begin, the closing session of IBET Conference 2022, please allow me to introduce the moderator for the session, Mr. Benny Leo. Benny Leo is the editor of Eastern Horizon, a Buddhist journal published by the Young Buddhist Association of Malaysia, as well as an author. He was the editorial consultant and contributor to Religions and Beliefs volume of the Encyclopedia of Malaysia. His writings have appeared in the Journal of Malaysian branch of the Royal Asiatic Society, Kajian Malaysia, and in Nurturing Child and Adolescent Spirituality Perspective from the World's Religious Traditions, published in the US. To date, he has edited nine books on Buddhism. Benny graduated with, with honors education from University of Science Malaysia and Masters of Public Administration from University of Malaya. He is also a senior vice president of a global company and sits on their boards in Malaysia and the UK. Please welcome Mr. Benny Leo. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adley, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I'm indeed honored to be the moderator for the closing keynote address by Dr. Reza Shah Kazemi from London on the theme of a Quranic view of religion, science, and ecology in our two-day IBET conference, where I believe we all had the opportunity to listen to various perspectives from both Islam and Buddhism on how we can protect and sustain our fragile environment. In our inaugural address yesterday morning, we were honored to hear from Geshe Daji, Daji Damdo, who represented His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, on the Buddhist perspective. As we all know, unfortunately, His Holiness could not be with us due to the COVID-19 lockdown in Dharamsala. It is therefore timely that in our closing keynote address, we are able to invite a very distinguished Islamic scholar in Dr. Uh, Reza Shah Kazemi to give us the Muslim perspective. We therefore look forward uh, to, to more in-depth on the Dr. Reza's lecture today. Uh, before I introduce or invite Dr. Reza to give his lecture, let me give a very brief introduction. Dr. Reza Shah Kazemi is an author and lecturer in the fields of comparative religion, Islamic spirituality, and Quranic studies. Among his works are Path to Transcendence, According to Shankara, Ibn Arabi, and Maester Eckhart, published uh, Bloomington in 2006, and the award-winning Justice and Remembrance, Introducing uh, the Spirituality of Imam Ali, uh, published in London, New York, 2006. Dr. Reza is also the author of Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism, which is a groundbreaking book that explores the scriptural and spiritual tenets of Islam and Buddhism in relation to one another, thereby creating a basis for comparison and analysis of two great spiritual traditions. Dr. Reza studied international relations and politics at Sussex and Exeter Universities before obtaining his doctorate in comparative religion at the University of Kent. He is currently a senior research associate at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London, UK. Let me now therefore invite Dr. Reza to deliver his closing keynote address titled The Quranic View of Religion, 
science and ecology. Over to you, Dr. Reza, please. Thank you very much. Um, have I successfully unmuted myself? Yes, we can hear yes. you pretty well. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, thank you, Benny. Thank you, Peck. Thank you, all of the members of ABIM and all of the organizers for inviting me to give this closing address. I'm uh, deeply honored by this uh, privilege of closing this wonderful seminar from which I've benefited very, very much. I'm tempted to actually change the whole play lecture and just give a sort of commentary on all of the insights that I've received from all of you, particularly Sister Dharmananda and uh, Professor Osman and Fatima Ahmed. Um, all of you uh, have given such interesting talks with very, very fascinating insights. What I have decided to do is to uh, refer occasionally to those uh, presentations, um, but on the whole, try and stick to what I have prepared here. And I'm sorry I don't have a, a PowerPoint presentation, um, but uh, occasionally I'll cut short some of my uh, prepared notes on themes that have already been covered by, especially by Fatima and uh, and by Professor Osman. So. Um, my talk is rather different from what I've heard hitherto in this respect, that I'm rather radically uh, microcosmic, let's say, in my approach, that there's an esoteric dimension to the question of the relationship between religion and ecology that I feel more capable of speaking about than really talking about the the uh, scientific aspects uh, i know that science is is right there in the title of the whole conference um but rather like goethe uh who talked about physics needing metaphysics um and i just quote from goethe here on this that one cannot properly properly speaking of many problems uh, one, sorry, one cannot properly speak of many problems in the natural sciences if one does not draw on metaphysics for help. Not that school and word wisdom, but rather that which was, which is, and which shall be before, with, and after physics. So without metaphysics and without esoterism, without spirituality, we can't understand science. And this is a, a point of view that has been championed for over half a century by say to say Nas. And what I'm going to say here in this talk is really in large part a commentary on what say to say Nasser in his many, many books, but particularly I should refer at the beginning of this presentation to a remarkable book that say to say Nasser wrote when he was probably only in his in his mid-30s, I think. In 1967, he wrote a book entitled Man and Nature. I've got it here, a new edition, The Spiritual Crisis in Modern Man. And when he stated the problem of the environmental crisis at that time, he linked it directly, not only to a, a very careful analysis of the intellectual and scientific causes, the scientific and technological causes with the philosophy of science that infused all of that from within the Western world, emerging from the end of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the scientific revolution, the so-called enlightenment. But he related all of these developments in the philosophy of science and in the desacralization of nature to a fundamental spiritual malaise that had taken grip in the soul of modern Western man. And it's that, it's the unfolding of that malaise in the souls of humanity and not just Western humanity, but as I'll go on to say in a moment, the whole world 
that we're seeing the devastating consequences of this loss of equilibrium between man and God, between the human being and the divine. And that cannot but have an overflow into the disequilibrium between human beings and nature. So I'll just read something from Sayyid to say Nas, um, how he stated the problem back in 1967. <clears throat> the lack of a sense of the transparency of things, of intimacy with nature as a cosmos that conveys to man a meaning that concerns him, is due to the loss of the contemplative and symbolist spirit which sees symbols rather than facts. The near disappearance of gnosis, understood in its true sense as unitive and illuminative knowledge, and its replacement by sentimental mysticism, and the gradual neglect of apophatic and metaphysical theology in favor of a rational theology, are all effects of the same event that has taken place within the souls of men. And this is really the focus of my presentation. What has gone wrong? What is this fall of Adam that has taken uh, its toll on the natural environment? How can we better understand what has happened to the Adamic consciousness? And how can we put right what is in the sphere of our competence to put right? And this is where, as I say, I'm radically microcosmic. I'm talking about what is it that we as human beings can do to ourselves, first and foremost, to uh, undo the effects of this loss of the contemplative and symbolist, and symbolic view of nature, the properly ecological view of the world, remembering that eco and the word ecology is made up of the word for oikos, which means home, and logos, which means the word. That this word, the creative word of God that has created the paradisal home in the beginning, what have we done to that? And we should remember that oikos is also the root of the word for economy. The ecology and the economy are both to do with how we are at home. And it also refers to the family that inhabits that home, oikos in the Greek. So on that note, I'm going to uh, read from Black Elk, a great, uh, possibly the greatest visionary medicine man uh, of the uh, Lakota Sioux. And what uh, he's, he's left us a great legacy in a couple of books. Joseph Eaps Brown has put these, made these available to us. Um, he's transcribed the conversations he had with Black Elk, who represents not just the Native American tradition, but also this contemplative symbolist view of nature that we all have to have revived in our consciousness as a, a prerequisite for that solution, which I'm arguing is to be found and can be applied first and foremost to ourselves, that we have to revive the sense of the wonder, the marvel, the beauty of nature and how na the natural world manifests and revitalizes our own intrinsic human nature, what is referred to in the Quran as the fitra, primordial human nature, at verse 30 of Surah number 30, of, entitled the Romans. And I'll come to that in a moment. But let's just hear. Black elk, Black elk giving us this beautiful statement. We should understand that all things are the work of the great spirit. We should know that he is within all things, the trees, the grasses, the rivers, the mountains, the four-legged animals and the winged people. And even more important, we should understand that he is also above all those things and all those peoples. So here we have a view of the divine imminence, the divine presence, the holiness of the spirit, penetrating, animating, enlivening the whole 
of the natural world and referring to all of these winged creatures as our fellow brothers and sisters. And that the great spirit transcends all of this. So we have the two vital dimensions of an authentic spirituality, an authentic scientia sac, as Saint Nasso would call it, a holy science, a holy, a sacred consciousness enveloping the transcendent principle of all things above and beyond the world and the imminent manifestation of the spirit within all things as the beauties of virgin nature. And this relates directly to a Quranic verse, which is number 38 of chapter number six, an arm, cattle, where every single creature is referred to as refer as belonging to an ummah, a community like yourselves. We are a human community, but the Quran says that there is no animal crawling on the earth, nor a winged creature flying in the air, but that it belongs to a community. It is part of ummah, the plural of ummah, which is also related to the word for the mother, ummah. They are all communities like you. So when we have this view of all of the species as pertaining to a religious community and not just an accidental contingent feature of some evolutionist process, then we understand that the loss of a single species is not just unfortunate or a disaster. It's a sacrilege, a single species that lost as a result of our madness in our greed and our consumerism. And let's not forget that one of the words for the, uh, for the devil in Christianity was the, the consumer, the one who instills in us desire for endless uh, goods and things that the Quran refers to. Man has become intense in his desire for good things. So we justify this rapacious appetite that we have for good things by saying, well, the rest of the world just has to feed our appetite, feed our desire, has to try and satisfy us, whatever the cost. Now, the verse which I want all of us to have in the back of our minds as the most important, I would argue, the most important verse in the Quran, as regards the absolutely imperative nature of, uh, let's say, the absolutely imperative force, the command that God gives us as to what will happen, what must happen before his, her, or its grace can put right what is wrong with a world that is very, very wrong, is the imperative of changing ourselves. And the, this verse I'm talking about is verse 11 of chapter number 13, the Surah Ar-Rad, the Surah of the Thunder. Part of that verse says this, Truly God will not put right, will not change the condition of a people until they change the condition of their own souls. So this means that each and every one of us is being asked by God to change ourselves as a prerequisite for this unimaginable grace that comes from the Almighty, that is, as it were, magnetized by our efforts, if our microcosm, our small world, the insan, the alam sahir, the, the small cosmos, the microcosm that corresponds to what in Islamic spirituality is called the great human being, the insan, the uh, alam sahir, and the insan kabir. So insan, the human being, is a microcosm, a small world, and the world is a huge human being, a huge spirit of the human being. 
And this perspective is not just one that was inherited from the Greeks, the microcosm and so on, in Plato's Phaedo and in his Republic. This is a concept that's right there in the very heart of the Islamic revelation and commented upon by the great luminaries uh, of the early Islamic period. And, and not just by the scientists and philosophers and mystics that came much later. We have, first of all, in the Quran itself, we have a verse that tells us that your creation, speaking to us as in the plural, all of you, your help, your creation and your resurrection is but as the creation and the resurrection of a single soul. It's just like the creation and the resurrection of one single soul, whole of humanity. And as it were, commenting upon this, we have Imam Ali, the cousin and the son-in-law of the Prophet, who in a very famous poem established, as it were, the paradigm of this idea of the microcosm, the whole of the greatest cosmos being somehow enfolded within the human consciousness, within the human being, in a poem that says, you consider that you are just an insignificant speck, but within you is enfolded the greatest cosmos, the Alam Al Akbar. So you are the clear book. The Kitab Mubin is a way of referring to the Quran, the book which is itself clear and which clarifies all things. You are the clear book. By whose letters that which is hidden becomes manifest. So don't just consider yourself this insignificant speck in the universe, within you is enfolded the whole of the universe. And when we use this word, enfolded, entawa, we can't help but think of what these new uh, theories are putting forward in terms of our interrelatedness, our interconnectedness, that which Sister Damananda spoke about so beautifully, our interconnectedness. And this is a basic feature of, of uh, of the worldview of Tawheed, not just the principle of oneness, but the principle by which all multiplicity is rendered one. It's a process of unification. And this unification process implies an actual state of affairs where we are all interconnected. And here I can't help but think of the great Buddhist concept of Pratitya Samudpada, which expresses this codependent origination of immeasurable, innumerable chains of causality interlocking in extraordinary, beautiful, and unifying ways. So, coming back to this idea of changing ourselves and this change affecting this, the greatest cosmos, we have to just give a little definition of. Uh, the word in the title of my talk, a Quranic view of, of religion, science, and ecology. And religion is all about, from the Latin root, re ligare, to tie together, to bind up again that which has implicitly been untied. The bond has been broken. And I would like to apply to this concept of religion, something that I believe helps us, since this is an Islam-Buddhism dialogue, as well as a dialogue on ecology, I would like to suggest that one of the ways in which we can profitably benefit from the religions in a comparative religious context is to use not so much the Abrahamic idea of religion or deen in Arabic, um, or just the Latin one, but the 
the Hindu and the Buddhist concept, particularly the way in which the Buddha referred to his teachings as an upaya, uh, a saving stratagem, I think it's been translated quite well as, a, uh, one could almost call it a kind of, and I think it's been translated as skillful means. I would like to propose a translation of this key term, Upaya, as a soteriological mythology. Now that's quite a mouthful, but it means soteriological means to say, question of salvation. And mythology, not in the sense of something that never really happened, myth as in fable or fantasy, but mythological as related to the root of the word of myth, which is mu, M-U, where we get the English word mute, be silent. The myth, the mythology, is that which gives you a narrative of a situation, a principle, a reality that infinitely transcends the human capacity of expression, of linguistic articulation. If we look at religion as a phenomenon, of soteriological mythology. We don't need to take absolutely literally what we find in our scriptures, for example, especially in Abrahamic scriptures, but we take it microcosmically, spiritually, metaphysically, and we uh, grasp, for example, we're talking about the fall of Adam, what exactly it means. And here, I would like to give an example of what I mean by applying this idea of higher soteriological mythology to something that my great teacher, um, Dr. Martin Lings, uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Sirajuddin, which uh, he wrote in this book, The Book of Certainty, which was a book on, on, on uh, Quranic exegesis from a spiritual point of view, when he talked about uh, the fall of Adam and what it means, he said this, when it is said that Adam was driven out of the Garden of Eden, the meaning is that mankind in general had lost the inward paradise of the eye of certainty. In other words, the eye of the heart as well as the paradise of the outer world. The state of the outer world does not merely correspond to the general state of men's souls. It also, in a sense, depends on that state. What he's saying here is that the state of the outer world, in a certain sense, depends on the state of human beings' souls. Since man himself is the pontiff of the outer world, thus the corruption of man must necessarily affect the whole world. This is a wonderful example of applying to a narrative in Genesis, the our scriptures, the, the Quran, a view that relates this description of a state of affairs that is unimaginable. How it is that from a primordial paradise of perfection, we all have fallen into making this world into a hell. How has it happened? It happened in this sort of way that Adam and Eve were lured by Satan, understood not as some being out there, but as very much the being within here. And this is something I'd like to add to Fatima Ahmed's talk when she spoke about Satan being out there and the nafs al-amara, the soul that commands evil. This is uh, just for those of you who may not have heard Fatima uh, speak, she referred to the three degrees of the soul. The nafs al-amara, the nafs that commands to do evil. The nafs al-lawama, the soul that accuses itself the soul that has begun to try and put right what it's doing wrong. And then the nafs al-mutma'inna, the soul that is at peace in the certainty of ultimate reality. So in, those, in that Quranic view of psychology, we uh, 
see that the nafs of amara, the soul that commands to do evil, is a soul that is op has opened itself to the suggestions of the satanic principle within itself. So it's not just something outside. Um, we have so many supplications by the prophet himself. In most of his khutbas, it says, I seek refuge in God from the evil of my own soul, from the shaitan within. And in one very famous incident, when one of his wives, Aisha, had lost her temper or something, um, and she was shouting, and the prophet said, your shaitan has, has prevailed over you, Aisha. And she said, oh, I have, a, I have a Satan within me. And he said, yes, everyone has one. And she said, even you? Oh, prophet of God, is it even me? But my shaitan has submitted, has, has made the surrender to God. In other words, that element, that, that insinuation of evil possibilities, suggestions within the soul that's somehow embedded within us as a possibility, that very possibility within the soul has been converted, has been transformed, has gone back to its original um, absorption within all possibility. And all possibility is the infinitude of divine goodness, the sovereign good, Ar-Rahman. So in a sense that that possibility for evil has been nullified, overcome, and as it were, converted into to sheer all possibility, which is the definition of the infinitude of the sovereign good. So that's the task to overcome this evil within ourselves. And when we talk about the narrative of Satan drawing us out of the paradisal garden, he seems to be saying to us, in the, according to the Quran, that don't you want to eat from that tree that you've been forbidden to eat from? Don't you want to become immortal? Don't you want this to be to be forever? And don't you want to become gods, as it were? And this is, according to Imam Ali again, this is why Satan is described as the uh, the leader of the proud and the forerunner of the fanatics. That it's all about the insinuation of desiring something for oneself forever instead of having that symbolist and contemplative view of the absolute beauty of god in the garden in which we can participate forever if we trade stay true to our primordial human nature and here i should just add that when i keep referring to our primordial human nature i'm talking about what professor osman referred to also, the fitra, the primordial human nature, verse 30 of uh, surah number 30. And I should just, because I probably won't get there in my notes, I'd better just remind you of what that verse says. It's so fundamental to our capacity to understand and to return to our true selves. Um, and that verse is as follows. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفَةً فِتْرَةَ اللَّهَ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمْ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمْ So set your purpose, your face, your entire being for religion as one who is a Hanif, as one who is like Abraham, a pure monotheist one who inclines always to the ultimate unitive reality hanif this is the fitz of allah the pattern the configuration the nature patterned by god and remember one of the words for god one of the names of god is al fatir the creator of the heavens and the earth and the fitra is the resulting creation the fitra of Allah, the fitra of God, that primordial nature which God has, has established for each and every human soul, which is inalienable and immutable, 
and universal and primordial. It's that with which it's our birthright. It's the most fundamental level of our congenital spiritual infrastructure, let's say, upon which all subsequent religions are so many superstructures. And each of those religions is to be evaluated in terms of success or failure by the degree to which that religion awakens and helps us to realize this ultra, this primordial, immutable, inalienable, universal, primordial human nature. What is it that makes us human beings? And every religion is there in order to remind us of who we are, what we are, what we can be. So this religion this is, is called Dhalika Deen al Qayyim. This is the eternally established religion, the eternally upright religion. Qiyama, the, 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 the uh, Mustaqim religion, the one that guides you to the straight path and is always there. But most people do not know that this is the fundamental religion, the religion of the fitra, the religion of human nature what it means to be human. So let's go to, uh, where should we go? Um, Benny, how long uh, have I been speaking for? How long do I have left? Uh, right now you've been speaking for about 40 minutes. If you, if you leave now, 40 minutes, four zero. So if we, we have, uh, if we could leave some time for about 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you could take another maybe 10, 15 minutes. Or 10 All minutes, right. 10, 15 Thank, minutes. You very, thank, thank you very much. Very good. So what I was planning to do was to go through a series of um, dimensions of the science of Tawheed in relation to ecology, to go through the cosmological, the phenomenological, the psychological, the eschatological, and the soteriological. And because obviously I don't have time to go into all of these categories, I'll leave that for when, hopefully, uh, inshallah, I'll, um, I'll write this up as an article. But for now, what should I focus on for these last 10, 15 minutes? Um, Let's, let's go right to the soteriology, the last section, um, and to talk about how we can imitate our brothers and sisters in creation, our fellow communities. As I said earlier, this idea that Black Elk gave us of our brothers and sisters, Mitako, when, when uh, we had this Mitako, uh, I'm trying to remember now, I've forgotten the way in which the Native Americans refer to all of our relations. Mitako Oyasin. Mitako Oyasin. All of you are my relations the Lakota Sioux say, all creatures are my relations. We are all related. Well, what is it that those relations are brothers and sisters in creation? What is it that they're doing by their very nature that can help us to do supernaturally what is there ingrained within our human nature, our fitra? What they're doing, according to the Quran, is they are engaged in constant prayer, glorification of the Lord. That is what every single creature is doing. We have this wonderful verse in Surah Al-Isra, the Surah of the Night Journey. That's number 17, and it's verse 44. In min shay'in illa yusabbihu bihamdihi. There is nothing in the whole of creation that does not glory, that does not hymn the glories of God with praise. Then in the 
chapter called Light, the Surah to Noor, which is number 24, verse 41. Do you not see that everything in the heavens and the earth praises God? Everything in the heavens and the earth is praising God. All the planets, all the stars, all the creatures on earth are praising God. And in case we get caught up in this philosophical or abstract idea that yes, everything by its existence is praising God because God has given it its existence. We're not allowed to get away with this philosophical abstract view of things because the Quran immediately goes on to say, what they and the birds in flight. And in order to recite this properly in the Arabic, you have to prolong this word safat by six beats at least. So you say, what they and when you hear it, you can almost, it's onomatopoeic. You can, the sound of these words, of the birds in flight, helps you to imagine and see those birds. So hearing is transformed into vision through the Quranic revelation. You feel and hear, and you want to fly with those birds in glorifying God. Each of those birds knows its salat, its prayer, and its tasbih. What we do with these beads, we glorify God constantly. And each one knows how to do its prayer and how to do its tasbih. But do we know how to do our prayers according to the rites and the rituals, the sacraments of our particular religion? Because according to the Quran, it's God who is at the source of all of these religious rites and rituals. It's not as if there are different gods up there that give different rites and rituals to different communities. It's one God who gives, who manifests his, her, its supreme generosity by giving different religious communities their rites and their modes of prayer, their manasik in one verse of the Quran. But the key verse here is verse 48, of chapter number five, Al Ma'ida, which says that for each of you communities, we, O oh, the Lord, we, God, have established a shir'ata wa min a law and a path, an outward law of order and an inward path of spiritual transformation. If we wish, we could have made you one ummah, God says in the Quran. But he made you as you are in order to test you by means of that which he has given you. So compete with each other in good things. Healthy competition. Compete with each other. His Holiness the Dalai Lama once gave a beautiful talk to uh, monks of the Buddhist and the, I think, the Benedictine order. Um, somewhere in the United States. And he said that we have come together to have healthy competition, not unhealthy competition, but healthy, to compete with each other, to, to use our methods and our disciplines of contemplation, of focusing on the principle of absolute compassion, absolute mercy, absolute goodness, and to really engage with these principles so they become part of us. And this is what we are being asked to do by God in the Quran. So compete with each other in good things, not just sitting quietly meditating and imbibing the principle of compassion, but practicing it. And, uh, well, one could say a lot about how His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is the most wonderful exponent, practitioner of the principle of compassion. Um, God bless him and keep him there for all of us. Um, so this is the soteriology. Now, how does this um, relate to the putting right of the universe? Well, the prophet of Islam said that the end, the hour will not come. The end of this world will not come. For as long as there is at least one person saying, Allah, Allah. 
He didn't say just Allah once, he said it twice. Allah, Allah, as if to indicate invocation. Zikr Allah, the remembrance, the invoking, the repetition of this, what the Hindus and Buddhists would call this mantra. Like the Nembutsu in Japanese Buddhism, the Japa Yoga in Hinduism, the Jesus prayer in Christianity, the goes on in all of the traditions. Black Elk speaks about the continuous prayer. When St. Paul says, pray without ceasing. How can you pray without ceasing? St. Dimitri of Rostov tells us that you pray without ceasing in only one way, and that is by having the name of, of Jesus glorified constantly in everything that you do. The Quran gives us many, many verses about the absolute importance of invoking the divine name, remembering God through invoking his name, saying Allah, Allah, and all of the other names in all of the other traditions of revelation. So this is the, the chief means by which uh, we go to go back to the Quranic idea of this transition from the nafs al-amara, nafs al to nafs al mutmainna the soul that commands evil, the soul that blames itself and puts right what's wrong with itself to the soul that is finally at peace and is addressed by God, return to your Lord in pleasure that is his in thee and thine in him. Mutual ridwan, mutual contentment. And this nafsa mutmainna, the soul that is at absolute peace through the certainty of God's reality, which is infinite beauty. This soul at peace is a soul through whom blessings come into this universe. And we talk about the Dalai Lama as being the physical embodiment of the principle of Avalokiteshvara, of absolute infinite compassion flowing from Amitabha, from the principle of infinite light and truth and goodness. What we're talking about is essentially what every single soul has the capacity to be. Every single soul can become the channel of grace to the extent that it approximates this degree of peace and certainty in the absolute reality of the infinite beauty of the divine principle. Every single soul can become a channel of that grace. And the prophet himself has said that this world would not subsist, the rain would not fall, the sun would not shine, were it not for 40 souls, the Abdal, through whom these natural phenomena occur. But there are 40 souls, 40 people whose hearts are like the hearts of Abraham. And through these people, you drink and you eat. These are the channels of grace through which it comes. Imam Ali also speaks beautifully about this, but I better not go there. Let me just finish. I'm, I'm very grateful to you, Benny, for giving me a few more minutes. And I do want to have time for questions. So I will finish on uh, Saint Seraphim of Sarov, who in, in wonderful descriptions that we have of him being transformed into fire, into fiery light by his, his disciples, see him and he's just become pure light, like a fire in his head. How did this happen, say, Lord, uh, uh, Seraphim? And he says, you too can become like this. If you, he said, if you can find inner peace, thousands around you, will find their salvation. There you have it. There you have the incommensurability between someone who is really nafs al really has understood, assimilated that itminan, tumatnina, that peace, that serenity, which is at one with absolute certainty, deriving, as I say, from a vision of the heart, which sees the absolute beauty of infinite reality. Once you have entered into that great peace fully, 
then according to Saint Seraphim and according to many other great mystics and metaphysicians in so many of the traditions of the world, if you find that inner peace, if you find that unitive principle within yourself that identifies your deepest self, capital S, with the sovereign good, the absolute good, then that good will, in a mysterious and invisible way, it will radiate through the whole of creation. We can't measure that sort of thing, but what we can, what we do know is, and what we feel viscerally is exactly what Sister uh, Damananda said, that a small action, an apparently small action of pure goodness that, that she performed with her sister nuns uh, in feeding one family, then 10, and then what do you get? 10,000 tons of wheat coming from somebody who says, you are so inspiring in what you're doing. Let me give you 10,000 tons of wheat to distribute to how many? Hundreds of thousands of families. That's what it's all about. That was tangible, but it was just a sign of what can happen through individuals who really begin to give themselves to God, who really try and find God within themselves, who are really invoking who are really reciting their scriptures, praying to God, supplicating, and doing supernaturally what the whole of creation is doing naturally. And then we become reintegrated into that principle of, of uh, unification of Tawheed. And I just will finish with Ramana Maharshi, the great Hindu sage of the uh, early 20th century, died in, in 1950s. Uh, a man who was following Ramana's teachings said, Ramana, I feel, yes, I'm asking myself the question that you've asked me to ask myself, which is, who am I? I'm doing it, I'm following your discipline, but how can I change the world? And Ramana just looked at him and said, you are the world, full stop. Thank you, Benny, I'll stop there and look forward to um, opening yes. up to the question. Thank yes, you very thank much. you, Dr. Reza, for your very illuminating uh, exposition of Islamic spirituality and its dynamics, and then your, your, you know, your ability to bring in references to man and nature from Said Nasir, which I think has been very illuminating as well. And also on Black Elk, right, which is the great Oglala Lakota educator. I think that was really great. But for me as a student of Buddhism, I've been personally very inspired by your, by your illuminating talk because what you mentioned there from an Islamic perspective reminds me of so many things that, uh, that we learn in the in the Buddhist teachings, for example, you, you talk, each one of us is asked by God to change ourselves. And this is what His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, always said, we should transform ourselves. And then you, you talk about the concept of interconnectedness, interlocking causality, which is again a, a very important principle that guides the, the life of the average Buddhist. He talks about the soteriological mythology of Upaya, which is the practice of com skillful compassion in our everyday life. And something very, really very interesting is you mentioned about Satan, not uh, an, an evil being out there, but, in, but within us. And this is what in Buddhism, in the mythology of evil, we have the concept of Mara. So again, mm -hmm. you, you, you remind the Buddhist participants and speakers of, of, the, of the need to know the Satan within them, within them rather than the Satan outside. And you also talk about the primordial human nature, our ability to understand and return to the true self, as mentioned in Islam. And this is, again, a fundamental teaching in Buddhism. We call it the Tathagatagarbha, Buddha nature, which is so, so important. So I could go on because your, 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 your talk has been really very inspiring and illuminating. And I'm sure out there, there will be many who would uh, love to have questions uh, asking you to, to respond. So, 
I've also got many re requests on my chat room that uh, we, are, we are quite happy to extend the, the, the time because. Thank you. Yes. Danny, may I just sorry, sorry to interrupt, but could I ask you to repeat that very last point that you made about I didn't catch the Buddha, the, uh, the Buddhist term that you used. The very oh, last Buddha nature is Tathagata Garba. Tathagata okay. no, Tathagata Garba. Yeah. No, I did okay. that. I Great. I As I was saying, of... you know, I think there there'll be many questions for 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 you. So we'll be quite happy maybe to extend a little bit longer. And uh, yeah. if there are any questions, those who like to to ask questions, you could raise hands. Yes, Professor Imtiaz, could you unmute uh, yourself? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Professor Imtiaz, I think you, you need to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Reza, very nice to see you again after a long time. Uh, Hello. And thank you very much for an enlightening talk. Uh, my just one question is, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on what Benny and I, uh, Benny commented on and also uh, what I caught from you about the Upaya as soteriological mythology? Thank you. Right, well, uh, yeah, as you know better than I do, uh, in TRs, um, it's normally translated into English as skillful means or saving stratagem. And the, the best image that I can think of in terms of the Upaya is the well-known image of the, uh, the Buddha pointing to the moon and saying, look at the moon that I'm pointing at and not at the finger that's pointing. So religion is a means to an end it's a signpost rather than the end in itself what we're seeing in our all of our religions unfortunately is a confusion of the means for the end so that religion is seen as you know the deen we have to uphold the sharia we have to uphold the religion as if it were god whereas the religion the sharia is a path leading to god so we if we follow that path to where they, or at least follow the trajectory, then we're moving in the right direction. But if, if our path is from here to our religion, then we are falling foul of the, the mythology as opposed to the principle that the mythology is actually pointing to, the mu, the essence, which I think in order to expand this slightly, one has to bring in the idea of the shunya, of the void in Buddhism, that because the ultimate reality is the void, is the shunya, what we in Muslim terms would refer to as the essence, not that the essence of God is somehow a vacuum, devoid of reality, but it's devoid of relativity. And being devoid of relativity, it is by definition, it, it by definition excludes all relativity. That's why the Prophet of Islam said, focus and meditate upon the names and qualities of God, but not upon the essence, because there is no possible connection between the mind that meditates. And the essence, which is devoid of any relative properties, such as would allow a designation of names and properties upon which we could meditate. The essence is absolute reality, absolute reality, which excludes all relative reality from the point of view of its absolute transcendence. Even if from the point of view of its imminence, it acquires, assumes, those names and qualities that allow us relative beings to have a relationship. And let's remember that that's the meaning of relativity, relationship. That for us, relative beings to have a relationship with the absolute, the absolute has to make itself relative. And it makes itself relative by the shunyata, by the manifestation of the void, by shunya murti, by actually manifesting what is there is what in Islam we call the, the hidden treasures. When God says in a famous, I don't know if this came up in Professor Usman's talk, 
كُنْتُ كَنْزًا مَخْفِيًّا فَأَحْبَبْتُ أَنْ أُعْرَى فَخَلَقْتُ الْعَالَمِ The famous saying in the Sufi tradition, it's not, it doesn't have a strong isnad, as they say, in the exoteric tradition. But according to the Sufis, the Prophet said that God said, I was a hidden treasure and I loved to be known, so I created the world. So these, these, these inner treasures of infinite beauty that were, as it were, within the divine essence, they become manifested because God, quote, wished to and loved, ahbabtu, God loved to make manifest to another, to relativize, to go out of himself, as it were, in order to realize the reintegration within himself through the other, all of these unimaginable processes that go so far beyond our capacity to put into words, but which do not go beyond our capacity to awaken an in intuition of. We have a kind of visceral intuition when we hear the truth of our revealed scriptures, when we hear, if we're Buddhist and we hear the Pali Canon, we hear what the Buddha said. The Buddha is speaking from his Buddha Vatu, his essential nature as Dharmakaya, not just the, the body of his manifestation, Nirmanakaya and so on, but in his Dharmakaya, the Buddha, the Buddha's own infinite essential self, that is speaking to our own infinite self. It's only the God within ourselves, the divine consciousness within our spirit, that can hear and respond to the divine spirit that is given from above ourselves. Now, how does all of this interaction, this communion between the relative consciousness and the absolute consciousness come about? The answer is no answer. You cannot put it into words in a way that is satisfactory. So what are you left with? Mythological narratives, a soteriological mythology. A mythology that saves you, not by virtue of what it says, but by virtue of what it is pointing to, what it can awaken in the intuition, in the spirit, in your divine consciousness, to the extent that the veils of ignorance, of pride, of arrogance have been to some extent opened up, to some extent they've been rendered, uh, they've been dissolved by one's positive aspiration on the one hand, and by the beautiful revelation from God on the other. To some extent, these veils of ignorance have been penetrated, dissolved. So that's why I, I, I would refer to it as soteriological mythology. Let's talk about Mara that Benny just referred to. Mara, the principle of the evil one, the God that couldn't stand the idea that the Buddha was about to be enlightened. So what does he do? He comes along and he says, oh, you're not, you're not the enlightened one. I am. I'm the only one who's enlightened. And I'll show you that you can't be enlightened because look at my daughters. I'm going to, to, to tempt you, to seduce you. Very similar to what we have in the Quran about Satan. Mutatis mutandis. But Mara tries to lure the Buddha out of his bodhisattvic moment. He's on the brink of enlightenment. And then according to the Mahayana tradition, as you all know, the vows of the Bodhisattva, he will not enter enlightenment until the last blade of grass is enlightened. The sacrificial compassion, that he will not even enter into full nirvana, into the full realization, until every blade of grass, which itself has some great ecological significance, it's a blade of grass, just like the Buddha held up a flower. And this is probably the greatest example of the upaya, and the Buddha gave the flower sir, which the Zen Buddhist tradition was, in a sense, born out of that one flower. That everyone comes, the disciples, the bhikkhus are waiting for the Buddha to speak. And what does he do? He's silent. And he just lifts up a flower. That is soteriological mythology. That is not even uttering a word. That is relating to this the silence, the more that we get mythology from, 
the myth, that shunya, that void, that complete emptiness, out of which something so miraculous as this one flower has emerged, this one flower that expresses the totality of the beauty and eternity of ultimate reality, that one flower does it in a way that a million words couldn't. That's all he had to do to hold up the flower. That is upaya. That is saying, don't wait until something comes out of my mouth for you to say, oh, yes, yes, I understand. <laughs> but then just meditate, contemplate. What is in this flower? What does this manifest? What does it reflect? What does it awaken? What does it initiate? What movement of spiritual assimilation, of interiorization? Does this one flower bring about for you? I couldn't do it with a million words. The Buddha is, as it were, saying. And that's why I love that story of the Zen, in the Zen tradition, that if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. <laughs> that's Upaya. That's, you know, a wonderful mythological way of saving you from what? From saving you from the illusion that the Buddha is some being out there that is separate from your own seed of salvation, of illumination, of enlightenment. It's not separate. And if you think it is, then kill it. Because you cannot realize the transcendence of the essence without, to some degree or other, shattering the form, negating lesser reality this relativity on this lower plane in order to open up to the reality of the transcendent so anyway these are just a few um, comments by way of response to your your question thank you dr reza any other questions from the from the chat chat box well we have some questions here from the, the chat room uh, there's one from Tan Chi Kyung. Uh, let me just read that, uh, Dr. Reza. I'm deeply inspired by your narration that according to the Quran, the whole of humanity is a single soul connected to the universe. It reminds me of a scientific hypothesis called Gaia, which proposes that Mother Earth is a great organism by herself. In Islam, we also believe that only humanity as a soul, as a creature, and all other creatures, Allah has no soul. So how do you relate the two notions of humanity as a single soul and Mother Earth as a single organism in invoking our own ecological consciousness? In invoking our own? Our own ecological consciousness? Ecological consciousness? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, that's an interesting question. Um, I would, I prefer, I mean, I know about the Gaia hypothesis to some extent, but um, I'm much more comfortable in making this, this relationship between the whole of humanity as a single soul and mother, uh, mother nature, virgin nature, um, as being our, our collective home, our mother, precisely, through I suppose in scientific terms, I'm more comfortable with um, David Bohm's theory uh, of the implicate order and what he calls the unfolding of what is enfolded within uh, the universe. Um, I see the connection there because uh, when I talked about Imam Ali and his statement that his poetic statement, it's a poem in which he said this, that within you is enfolded the greatest cosmos. The word enfolded is precisely the word that that Bohm uses. And the implicate order that connects all of us is something quite mysterious, but a wonderful sort of, 
I wouldn't call it a scientific proof, but I would certainly call it a, um, a significant piece of evidence in favor of the hypothesis or in favor of pointing towards the spiritual truth that we all know to be the truth, which is that we are all connected in subtle, invisible ways. Um, but uh, Bohm's theory of the implicate order arises out of Bell's theorem. And uh, this, just to very briefly remind those of you who may not remember, uh, when you spin, when you change the spin of an electron in one part of the world, that, and that electron has been disentangled, as it were, from its brother, sister electron, hundreds of thousands of miles away, what you find is that is what they call non-locality. You find that there is a mysterious connection, a message that is sent from this electron to that one, hundreds, thousands of miles away, instantaneously, it's faster than the speed of light, superliminal. It traverses this space because that electron says, right, well, you've changed the spin on my brother over there. I'm going to change it in the opposite direction. I know what you've done. So Bell's theorem, come, theorem comes along and, and, and actually blows the whole Einsteinian theory that nothing can move faster than the speed of light, or something can, which means that there is some incredible, mysterious connection between every single particle of the universe and every other particle of the Everything is interconnected in ways that go well beyond the space-time limitation. And so this interconnectedness that helps us to see that we are all one. This is a, an aspect of Tawhid, of course. Um, this confirms what I understand to be the Gaia hypothesis of, of, of Mother Nature, um, as, as it were, containing all of us as, as a human, as one species amongst others. There's no contradiction here. But I think from a Quranic point of view, what I should say is refer to the surah and zilzal the surah of the earthquake this is a surah which a chapter which is extraordinarily powerful and relates to the end of of this cosmos now a little a side note here something i wanted to say in the presentation but we, this is an appropriate place to say it which is that the Quranic chapters which describe eschatology, the end of this cosmos, are at one and the same time describing the indescribable implosion, collapse, dissolution of the cosmos, the stars, the sun, the planets, everything. And it describes the process of death of the microcosm. Because remember, everything about the macrocosm is reflected in the microcosm. Therefore, when the macrocosm's death is being described, it's the death of the individual soul that's being described, what we're going to go through. Each, for each one of us, we will see the sun folded up. We will see the moon colored red. We will see the stars dissolve dust colored. We will see all of these things in the process of that unimaginable dissolution, which death is. So that is extremely, and the prophet Muhammad himself said, man mata kad hamat kiyamatuhu. He who has died, his resurrection has been established. So everything that's described about the global resurrection, the macrocosmic resurrection, the day of judgment, all of that happens as soon as a person dies. It's not as if they have to wait for some, some uh, distant thing. The Qiyamah has begun for that individual. That, that death is the opening to everything the Quran describes about the day of judgment. And... Here, I, I should all make a little footnote as well, that um, when we talk about judgment, 
the day of judgment. And we think that our Buddhist brothers and sisters will think, well, this is exactly the kind of mythology that we can't participate in because it's too anthropomorphic. <laughs> it conceives of some god up there who's going to judge you. The long beard is going to say, well, you know, I'm weighing you up and you, know, you go to heaven, you go to hell. Buddhist brothers and sisters find, yeah, that's exactly what we don't want, this kind of limitation, this restriction, this reduction of the Buddha nature, the Buddha in reality, to some mythical creature up there that we are all cowering in front of, as, you know, terrified slaves in chains waiting to see where we're going. That kind of mythology, that kind of narrative doesn't do anything for our Buddhist brothers and sisters. Whereas what we can do to build a bridge between the two traditions here is to refer to a verse in the surah, also in the surah al-Isra, I forget the number of it. And the verse says that on the day of judgment, you will be given a book that will be wide open. And you will be told, read your book. Your own soul is sufficient today as your own judge. You don't need any other external judge to come and tell you whether you deserve hell or heaven. Look at your book, read it, and you will understand through the eye of your heart, now unveiled, now seeing things properly in their true proportions, you will know where you have to go. All right, now that's, that's a bit of a side note. Uh, going back to this question, yes, the surah of uh, the earthquake, the zilzal. إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها وأخرجت الأرض أثقالها وقال الإنسان ما لها يوم إذن تحدث أخبارها بأن ربك أوحالها. Beautiful and powerful. I mean, terrifying, but at the same time, incredibly strengthening verses. Um, when earth is shaken with her final earthquake, remember now we're talking about earth as feminine. This is the mother earth. When the mother earth is shaken with her final earthquake, and she, the earth, gives, is relieved of her burdens, her heavy things. وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا And the human being says, what's wrong with her? يَوْمَئِذٍ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا On that day, she will relate her news, her tidings. She will say what has been going on to her. Mother Earth will speak. She will release all of her burdens. She will be shaking and she will speak. بِأَنَّ رَبَّكَ أَوْحَا لَهَا Because your Lord will have inspired her. To speak now after having been silent and having been raped, having been abused for so long by all of us, now she's, she's what we've done. Yawma'idhin tuhaddithu akbaraha bi'anna rabbaka awhala. Yawma'idhin yasturu nasu ashtata. On that day, the whole of humanity will come forth in droves in order to see their actions. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى So whoever has committed an atom's weight of good will see it on that day. And whoever has committed an atom's weight of evil will see it on that day. So we're taken from this macrocosmic dissolution where we apparently are nothing. We're again little specks. We're thinking, oh, you know, what, what is all about? But then we're taken from the whole of the earth having her final earthquake and it's all over. And she now tells her story. We then are brought back to the absolutely unavoidable individual personal responsibility for every single one of our actions. وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى Whoever has performed a single tiny atom of evil will see it 
and if you perform the single good, you will see it. Everything will be there in that book, in that clear book. So looking at these eschatological chapters at the end of the Quran, we see that there is a, at one and the same time, the whole of us as human, we are all one, like one soul, but we are also particular. We have personal responsibility for every single one of our actions. And the, the relationship between us as a soul and our mother earth, as in terms of this Gaia hypothesis, we just refer to her as mother nature and as virgin nature, mother earth, virgin nature. And this is actually crucial to the understanding of ecology, because as I said at the beginning of the talk, Ecology and economy come from the same roots of oikos, the home. The home is something that envelops us, but it is also the family that inhabits the home. So we are the family, the human family that inhabits this paradisal garden, which we have, alas, turned into a, a hell on earth. So um, we'll, we'll go to the next question. Okay. So Teresa, actually, there's one more question here from the chat room. Can you explain the concept of the pontifical man in Islam? This is from Narudin al Akbar. Concept yeah, of the pontifical man, yes. Yeah, very briefly. Um, the word pontifical, pontifex, means the builder of a bridge. Mm. And it's why one refers to the Pope as the pontifex, the builder of the bridge, the, the bridge between us and, and uh, heaven. And uh, in Islam, it's really a, a translation of the idea of Khalifa, which Professor Usman spoke about, and I think also Fatima did. Um, uh, and this Khalifa uh, literally means one who comes after. But in the Quran, it's referred to as the being, human being, who represents God. God says, I will appoint for the earth a Khalifa, a steward, a representative. Of course, in the ordinary sense, Khalifa now just means a leader, um, the caliph of the Islamic community. But its original meaning is Khalifa to Allah bil Ard, the Khalifa, not the leader of God, but, the, but God's appointed vice gerund, the one who is a kind of plenipotentiary who represents God on earth and who is therefore the steward who has been given the amana, the trust. It says in one verse in the Quran that we offered the trust, the amana to the heavens and the earth that they speak from the, res the responsibility. But man took it up. Now this, the, the verse goes on to say that man took it up and he is proven to be ignorant and jahula, um, ignorant and, and uh, unjust. Uh, so this uh, pontifical aspect of man is one that has tremendous responsibility, concomitant with this freedom of the will. That we have free will and um, we have used it badly. This is basically what the Quran is saying. But on this question of the pontifex, the bridge builder, I want to go back to something that um, I was saying uh, regarding our prayers, our invocations, our recitations, our sacramental lives. That um, there is a, how should I put, there's a saying of the, pro of the Holy Prophet, that there are angels who roam the earth who are looking for majalis adhikr, for congregations of the vicar, for people who are congregating only in order to perform the vicar, to remember God, to invoke his name, to recite his scripture. And when they find such a majlis, a dhikr, such a, com a congregation of invocation. They call out to the other angels and say, come, we found such a 
uh, a majlis. Come, join us. And then when all the angels are congregated there, they join their wings in a vertical axis so that the wings of one join the wings of the other and so on, forming a link, a, a, a set of links in a chain that goes all the way up to paradise. This can be understood, you see, as the bridge. The bridge that connects human beings praying to God, invoking his name, reciting his scripture, and the angelic energies that are magnetized by this human assembly and then transmitted up all the way to heaven which means that it's not just our vix that goes up to heaven, our invocation and our prayer doesn't just go up to heaven, but those graces from heaven come down through the same angels that are connecting us to heaven. This is like Jacob's ladder, the angels going up and down. So this is a beautiful image the prophet has given us precisely of the meaning of pontifex of the bridge that is built between human beings who are acting like angels and the source of the angelic reality, which is heaven and ultimately God himself, herself, itself. So here, I'm, if, I, if you allow me, Benny, just one more hadith from the prophet, which is really very, very beautiful and which reinforces the, the uh, significance of what we do when we are saying Allah, Allah, in whatever language we are invoking God. Um, another wonderful statement from the prophet, it's related by a companion who was not known for his memory or for his knowledge of sayings from the prophet. So it makes it all the more interesting. This companion was called Muawiyah. Uh, he was the caliph of Islam after a civil war against Imam Ali, who I've referred to several times. And he was a companion of the Prophet. And he came out of the mosque of Damascus. And he saw, this was the, the great, you know, the mosque, the, the Umayyad mosque to become, uh, of the huge empire that Islam was at that time. Remember, this is in the generation of the Prophet. He was a companion of the Prophet. So, he came out of his mosque and he saw a group of people gathered together. And he said to them, why have you gathered? And they said, We have gathered in order to invoke God and to thank him for the blessing of Islam. And Muawiyah said to them, you've congregated like this for no other reason. And they said, for no other reason. And he said to them, I'm not asking you this out of any accusation. I'm just telling you this because I heard the prophet say, and he gives a little humorous note, which helps us to see the authenticity of this narration. He said, not one of you has the status that I have in relation to the prophet in terms of paucity of hadiths related from him. In other words, I have got maybe one or two statements that I remember from the prophet, you, may, you lot may have hundreds, thousands. So anyway, he says, I don't ask you this question out of accusation, but only because I heard the prophet say, when he came out of his mosque in Medina, and he saw a group of people gathered, and he said to them, why have you gathered? And they said, in order to invoke God and to thank him for the blessing of Islam. And he said to them, for no other reason. And they said, for no other reason. And then the prophet said, I don't ask you this out of any accusation, but only because Gabriel has come to me and has told me that God is boasting about you people in front of the angels. God is taking pride in you people before the angels, as if to say, this is the commentary that's been given, that God is saying to the angels, you have no other choice but to worship me, devote yourself to me, invoke me, 
praise me in my glories. You have no other, you have no free will. You are created for this one and only reason to sing my praises and to glorify me. But these human beings who have the capacity to become like animals or like angels, they have the freedom and look at them. They are doing on earth despite their bestial possibilities, so their evil tendencies, they have transcended those and they are invoking me. They are doing to me what you are doing to me. You have no freedom. They, you have freedom only to do this. They have freedom to do the opposite. So this is why God is boasting. He's taking pride in these human beings who are endowed with animalistic possibilities and yet are realizing the highest angelic possibilities of their human nature. So if you like, this is another way in which we can talk about Upaya, that all of this dialogue and all of these statements, we don't have to take them literally, but we have to understand the spiritual significance, read spiritually between the lines and understand what is being communicated of that mystery that in its essence remains incommunicable by words, but which words can elicit a remembrance precisely, a kind of not a remembrance of some cognitive content that we once knew and have now forgotten, but a remembrance in the sense of recollection, bringing back together those fragments of our being that have become fragmented, but which are all now integrated and awaken in us an awareness of our heavenly origin and of our heavenly destination, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Reza. I think for the interest of time, I think we will uh, conclude. But I have to say it has been a great learning session, uh, both illuminating, inspiring, yet profound, and also concise and to the point. So uh, I'm sure many of all those who have uh, ended the, your session have found it beneficial. And uh, I'm sure there'll be future sessions where we could have the opportunity to invite you again to, to, to share your, you know, your thoughts. So thank you again very much. And uh, I really appreciate uh, listening to what you have said and uh, given me thoughts on my own understanding of my own practice. So I will now pass back to Adli, the MC. Thank you so much, Brother Benny. And of course, thank you to our distinguished speaker that delivered the keynote address earlier. And now to conclude the conference, I would like to first invite Brother Muhammad Faisal Abdul Aziz, the President of Muslim Youth Movement of Malaysia, to read the resolution of the IBED Conference 2022. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. IBED, IBED 2022 Collective Resolutions. Next slide. Being a collective of religious and educational organizations concerned about climate change and the environment, we, the undersigned, are organizing the Islam and Buddhism Eco Dialogue IBED 2022. Uh, on 15 and 16 January 2022. This program is a manifestation of the commitment of the world community, especially Muslims and Buddhists, to protecting the environment and advocating climate justice for the sustainability of future generations. Therefore, we resolve to first continue to strengthen interreligious dialogue efforts at the local national and international levels to improve understanding between the world's multi-religious and multi-ethnic world communities. Second, foster efforts to protect the environment together through dialogue and cooperation between religions to ensure that the world is educated on the importance of protecting the environment based on their religious education. Third, spread awareness of protecting the environment and addressing climate change to all world leaders to ensure government policies in the world are sustainable 
fourth, defend the right to quality of life for today's generation and continuously commit to bringing an agenda of sustainable living and last, foster the understanding that the responsibility to, of defending this earth as a shared one and that all parties should cooperate to find a joint solution. IBED 2022 by Muslim Youth Movement of Malaysia, ABIM, Tibetan Buddhist Culture Center, Center of Malaysia, TBCC, Theravada Buddhist Council of Malaysia, TBCC, Vajrayana Buddhist Council of Malaysia, BBCM, International Institute of Islamic Talk and Civilization, ISTAC, and International Students of Islamic Psychology. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Muhammad Faisal Abdul Aziz, the President of Muslim Youth Movement of Malaysia, for reading the resolution earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters of faith, with the keynote address and the presentation of the resolution, it concludes IBAD Conference 2022. On behalf of the organizers, we thank you for your participation and support, and we truly hope that you have had a fruitful experience of learning and sharing. Be inspired to continue to inspire, to act, to mobilize for a better world of peace and harmony between all kinds and beings. Thank you and hope to see you in next year's IBIT conference. Until then, with the greetings of love and peace, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.